Yeah. Probably the week after fall break. I'll send out a more football? detail next week. Next Friday. Next so Friday. the week after that, I'll give you a take home. Are, are the exam takes home? Yes. Yeah. All exams will be taken. Oh, or is it yeah. But there will, there will be a time limit, like 24 hours. Yeah, so, so you have to get it done within 24 So for the exam, is it, is it, is it, is it, is it, so since the exam is take home, is, is that more like the like project or, or something or a, 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 a time project? Not really. No, it will be like the next one. Yeah, I can talk about that next week. <laughs> I'll, I'll send out more details. I don't have it all sorted. Huh? Okay, can we talk about it after class? All right, so... Uh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> I need to get going here because we are running out of time. I think so, later Friday, so we have the four, so we have the four break. So, uh, so we and then, uh, and then the, uh, on Wednesday oh, we there is an abstention, but on Friday, our session is, is cancelled. So. There's no lab next week. There is no lab next week. No lab. All right. So, uh, if everybody could just, uh, quiet down back there, please. <laughs> We have to get started for the class today. Um, all right, so the topics for today are, uh, I'm going to quickly review the thin lens uh, ray tracing that I posted a video on, and uh, that has also some uh, derivation of the magnification of the thin lens, which I didn't get to in the last class. Um, so uh, all that is posted in the supplementary video for today. And so I'll just quickly go over the ray tracing just to reiterate some of the main ideas, but I won't go into the details in that video. And then I want to go and talk about thin lens combinations. because That's where actually the ray tracing shows its power a little bit more, uh, allows us to like understand image formation from ray, from, from thin lenses without having to do the math all the time. Although of course the math is always helpful in the end. Um, and then, uh, probably not today, but we'll start work thinking, uh, looking into some optical instruments, starting with the human eye, and then telescopes and microscopes. That's probably for next week. Okay, so just a quick review of the thin lens formulas that you've learned so far. And uh, so the, um, so let's see. Thank you. See. Okay, um, so just to go over the thin lens formulas, we have a Gaussian lens formula that you that we derived, one over s naught plus one over si equals one over f, and the lens maker equation which tells us how f is related to the refractive index of the lens and the radii of curvature. And then in the video that I posted, I also derived a second equation that uh, governs a lens, which is called the Newton's equation, xo xi equals f squared, where xo is the distance of the object from the fo object focal plane and for the image from the image focal plane. So it's like you can think of it as how far away from these uh, from these focal planes are the object and the image located. And uh, yeah, you can see the derivation in the in that video. As well as I also derived the transverse magnification. Uh, just like with the spherical surfaces, the transverse magnification is simply the image uh, vertical or a transverse uh, height divided by the object height, and uh, just similar to the again to the spherical um, uh, surface, we get that this is minus SI divided by SO. Okay, so if you want, you can look at that as just take the image distance by the object distance. That's a very useful thing to remember. Whenever you have some imaging system, typically this magnification will be given by the image distance divided by the object distance. So you can immediately start to understand why in certain situations the object gets magnified or minified. Minified meaning the magnification is less than one. So the, the, the image looks smaller than the object. Well, that's just given by the ratio between the image distance to the object. So if you know those two, then you immediately know the magnification. And of course, you can work conversely. You can see uh, sim simple types of problems that I could give you is I give you the magnification and I tell you one of the object distance or the image distance and ask you to find the focal length, or I, or I do some combination of that. So that's like typical homework problem, exam problem, et cetera, okay? And uh, same thing with the, uh, well, we can also show, and again, this is shown in your in that video, that this is given by 
the xi, which is this distance from the image plane, divided by the focal length. So if you just have the focal length and the distance from the image plane, that also gives you the magnification. And similarly, there's another one for the object uh, distance. So all of these equations are interrelated, and you don't have to remember all of them. And, uh, uh, and you know, you'll have a take-home exam, so you can look at most of these equations. But it's useful to understand the derivation to know how, how they come about so that you can actually understand how to use them without having to rederive them every single time. OK. Also in that video, I posted uh, the longitudinal magnification. And that is just given by, similar to the transverse magnification, uh, longitudinal is like, if you look at this object, the horse, it is, it is extended along the optical axis. So far, we've been treating objects as though they only existed as a perfect two-dimensional object, which was like perpendicular to the uh, optical axis. But of course, objects might have some depth to them or some thickness to them. And that this longitudinal magnification tells us how that transforms into the image space. Okay, and we can see here that for a thin lens, it just goes as a square of the uh, transverse magnification. And finally, this is something I, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but you've seen this in your labs now quite 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 often, which is the inversion of the orientation inside in a thin lens, right? So left, uh, so the left going uh, rays become the right going rays or right going finger. And similarly, the uh, up becomes down, right? So up becomes down, left goes to right in a lens when, it, when a real image is formed like this. Uh, again, that just comes about from this from these equations for the transverse magnification. We know that uh, object is usually inverted by a positive lens uh, when a real image is formed. And so that, that holds true not only for the direction in uh, straight up and down in the plane of the board, but also coming in and out of the plane of the board. So that's what this uh, shows. Then you saw all that in the in the in your lab. Okay. Um, I want to introduce one more topic, which is the depth of field and and brightness. Um, before I do, though, let me just go over quickly on this PowerPoint the. Um, the, the, the ray tracing and sign conventions. Once again, we have gone through it. As I said, it's in the video, but I just want to quickly go over it here as well. So we introduced three rays in the ray tracing diagrams. Um, the first ray, the chief ray, as it is called, um, goes straight through the center of the aperture of the lens. So that's going through the center of the lens, O. And that ray, as we know, is undeviated. So it goes straight through, okay? Then we have a ray that's parallel to the axis. That's ray number two. This is the convention we always use in ray tracing. The chief ray is labeled one. The ray that's parallel to the axis is labeled number two. And that ray, which is parallel to the axis, as we know, must go through the focal plane, the image focal plane, okay? or image focal uh, at the point, the image focal point. And of course, with those two rays in a two-dimensional world, that's all we would need. We would just take those two rays, the one and two, and trace them, and that where they meet, that would be the formation of the image. But we also supply a third one, and this becomes useful when we do lens combinations. When we do lens combinations, we'll see that this ray is useful, because what it does is it goes through the object focal point, and we know by definition that creates an image at infinity, which means that this ray, ray three, must go parallel to the axis when it exits the, the lens, okay? And so in this case, as clear from this drawing, when the object is, uh, is uh, more than a focal length away from the lens, we see that an image is formed, which is inverted uh, and uh, usually magnified, but uh, as we look, that depends a little bit uh, on the number, will depend, of course, on the exact dimensions. Um, here is a camera which has been uh, modified to remove the prism that usually directs the rays of light from the object onto the film or onto the CCD that has been modified so that we can actually see the, the rays of light uh, coming up out of the camera. The prism has been removed. And so you can see here, you can actually see the image of the object on the front that, that would be coming from that lens. Um, you can see those rays right here. It's forming an image here and your eye is viewing that image. Similarly, we can do a negative lens. So in the video, I posted only a positive lens. So here I'm showing you the negative lens case. This can sometimes confuse people. So let's go over this one as well, okay? So again, we take the chief ray, the number one ray, and that goes straight through the, the lens, okay, as usual. 
And then, because for a negative lens, the focal length is negative, which means that the object focal plane is on this side. Even though the object is here, the object focal plane or object focal length is over on that side because it's negative. Okay? And similarly, the image focal length is over here on this side. So what that means is that a ray which is normally would go straight and hit that object focal plane, just coming back to here, right? The one that went straight through the object focal uh, plane went parallel to the axis. In the same way, the ray number uh, three, which would have been directed towards the object focal plane over here, is now going to emerge parallel to the axis. And similarly, the ray that would that goes uh, parallel to the axis now gets diverged and appears to be coming from this image focal point. Okay, so the dashed lines represent the rays that would have traveled if the focal plane, if the if the uh, lens were not there, or if the lens were to uh, were to were to be extended backward, if this ray were to be extended backward, that's where it would appear to be coming from. That's the image focal point. Okay, and you can see that these three rays now meet over here which is the uh, location of an object. You can see this object is a virtual, uh, sorry, uh, the location of the image. You can see that image is a virtual image because the rays are not converging towards that image. They appear to be diverging away from that image, okay? So this uh, is a virtual image. And as you can see, it's also smaller than the original object. And this can be seen in this uh, photograph here where uh, the textbook is being looked at through a concave uh, lens. So there's a biconcave. Lens. Okay, so to complete finally the story of the lens and the ray tracing, this summarizes sort of the various sign conventions that we have introduced now. I won't go over them, it just tells you uh, what we consider as positive and what we consider as negative for the signs uh, of the different distances. And then here, this is something that is useful to know uh, and to remember, but even if you can't, we'll show in the next uh, slide or so that you can kind of understand where these are coming from. This basically tells you for the convex lens, for example, if the ob object is located past 2F, then what is the type of uh, image? Where is the location of the image, the orientation, and the relative size of the image? So this table just gives you all of that in one information, and that's kind of helpful to have in the back of your mind if you're creating some system, like you can understand where the image is going to be so that you know where to put your the next lens, for example, okay, approximate. But I'll, I'll show you in a minute where this comes from as well, intuitively, okay. Um, okay, so what else did I want to say here? Um, all right, let me show you now intuitively where these trends come from. Uh, so it comes from this uh, figure, and we can start to understand it from the ray tracing uh, drawing. So let's start with an object that's very far away. So as you know, when the rays of light are basically parallel, when the object is very far away, the, the, the rays of light are like very uh, almost parallel to each other. And that those rays will then meet at the focal point. Okay. So that is kind of shown here that as the object uh, is, if it's, if it's further away, then it would have met at the focal point. But now let's say we bring it a little closer. So it's not quite at infinity. The object is not quite at infinity, but it's further away than this point, which is 2F. So this is f, that's 2f, and then, of course, infinity is to the left. So we can see for that situation, as we bring the object in closer from infinity towards the 2f point, the image, which originally, remember, the image was being formed at f. When the object was at infinity, the image was at f. Well, the image moves slightly away from f. Okay? It forms a little bit further out. Okay? So, uh, so it moves out, and it's in between f and 2f. So we see now that for objects, that are greater than 2f away, but less than infinity, the image is going to be between f and 2f. Okay. As we bring this object eventually to stand right at the focal point, okay. well, when it's right at the focal point, well, this object, uh, uh, sorry, at, uh, not at focal point, at 2f, sorry. This is at 2f, then we can trace the rays and see that the image will be at 2f. Okay. So 2f is like a symmetry point. Objects at 2f, give you images at 2f. And now we bring it in closer than 2f, and this is a typical situation for most simple lenses, although, of course, you have worked with some very short focal length lenses as well, uh, where the object may be much greater than 2f. But for many lenses, if the lens distance is, say, like 
20 centimeter or 30 centimeter optical table, then your objects are typically going to be between that 2F and 2F1. And now you can see when it's in between F and 2F, the image is now being formed past 2F. It's like an inversion, uh, it's like the symmetry again from that previous, uh, from that first situation where the object was further away than 2F and the image was formed between F and 2F. Well, as you bring the object now in between F and 2F, the image is going to be formed between 2F and infinite. Okay, so it's very simple to remember that from just that first couple of drawings. And then finally, of course, if we went exactly to the focal length, the image will not form here to form at infinity. So we are not showing that. And also, of course, notice how the object is getting bigger and bigger as we bring the image, uh, the object closer, the image is getting bigger. This is again, tells you uh, it's a magnified image because the, as the image is greater, the image distance is greater. The so image distance by object distance, remember is a magnification. So the object, uh, the, the image uh, size is going to be bigger than the object size. Okay? And then once you reach F, of course, the image goes to infinity, but now let's say we bring the object a little bit closer than F. This is also a situation that occurs sometimes in the lab. And so what will happen is as we get a little bit closer than F, now there's no real image that is formed because there's, you know, already when we were at F, the image was forming at infinity or very far away. Once you get closer than F, there's no corresponding space. It's a negative space that maps onto this space over here. And so in fact, there is only a virtual uh, image that is formed. And as you can see, this one is magnified also relative to the object for positive lens. So I encourage you to think about what will happen in the negative lens case, but I just wanted to show you this intuition that you should develop for the positive lens from this sort of arguments about where the images are forming. Okay, so that just summarizes all the things I just uh, said. Okay. So before I go on to virtual object ray tracing, which is I think a important topic and often confusing to many students, so I want to go over that a little bit in detail and then talk about how to use that for thin lens combinations. But before I do that, I want to talk about a topic that we have explored in the lab, but that we didn't talk about so far, which is the depth of field and the image brightness. Okay. So let's discuss those two topics. So, and again, I'll probably skip most of the derivation. I just want to give you the intuition for it. The derivation is fairly simple. Okay, so first let's talk about depth of field for a lens. Again, I'm going with the positive lens. Here, that's usually the one which has a, uh, a real image that is formed. So, so let's say we take a lens, okay? And normally we have the lens and it's just open uh, as usual, like, you know, the, uh, the clear aperture of this lens, as we call it, is just whatever area of the lens that light can get through, okay, the size of the lens, for example. But we can also stop down, as it is called, we create a aperture, a stop, which uh, those of you who like photography may be familiar with this. You stop down a camera lens, for example, right? As you stop it down, which means you're reducing the aperture and the amount of light that is getting through the system. And it's clear, right, that the amount of light is get, that's going to get through is less. But in exchange, what you get is an increased depth of field. And we'll see this as follows. So if I'm given this dia the diameter of this uh, aperture, which is over here, is D, okay? Obviously, when there's no aperture in front, the diameter is simply the diameter of the clear diameter of the lens, okay? Minus any mounting, opti uh, mounting hardware that might be on it. Okay, and um, then the rays uh, that are going through the system, let's say we have some rays and they're going to converge to a point over here. Okay. I've called a point P. That's like uh, the image of an infinitely far away object, for example, okay? And uh, let's call this point over here, B, point where this ray is coming from is A, okay? And um, yeah, I think that's all I need. And so, now what I'm going to do is imagine that instead of having the screen or your film or your eye at this point P, you move your screen or film by amount delta X. So now your, uh, your image is no longer a sharp point, but it is 
having some blurriness to it. That blurriness is some distance delta y. Okay. And let's call this point C. And this point, I can't use E or D again, so I'll use E. So C, E. And this is, of course, point P, where originally the image was being formed. Okay. All right, um, so you can uh, easily show that this triangle ABP, which is this big triangle, and the triangle CEP are similar. That's because they have two 90 degree angles, okay? And this angle in common, which means the third angle must be the same. So that's the definition of similar triangles. So if triangles, triangles ABP and CEP are similar, which means that their sides are in the same ratio, which means AB divided by CE is equal to B, um, P divided by EP. Okay? And from this, we get, and since uh, this AB is just B over 2, and CE is just um, delta Y over 2, and this is just SI, and this is delta X. Okay, so from this, we get the ratio delta x over delta y is equal to si divided by d, or implies delta x equals si divided by d times delta y. Now, of course, for um, you can make this a little bit more um, sophisticated, if you like, by saying, okay, if the object is truly at infinity, then, of course, this uh, SI must be the focal length, so this would be F over D, okay, for You may wonder what sets this uh, delta Y. This delta y, which is the blurriness of the uh, of the image, well, that's entirely set by your uh, by the resolution of your detector. Okay, so your detector uh, typically we think of a detector as like you know the eye, or it could be the pixels in your CCD camera that you have that is imaging that point over there, or you could have a piece of paper that's in your screen that you're moving around, and a piece of Paper, of course, made of tiny fibers, and those fibers have some size. Okay, and so when things start to like you know resolve uh, down to that size, of course, that's going to set a natural limit for how small the the resolution can be of your uh, uh, of your uh, uh, for example, a resolution of a photographic film, for example. Uh, for your eye, of course, it's set by whatever pixels are in your eye for your retina, for example. That's ultimately what sets your resolution. So whatever it is, this delta Y is usually given to you, is fixed by your detector system, effectively. So delta Y is fixed. So this argues that delta X, the depth of field, over which we can still see a sharp image, right? We don't want to exceed delta y. Okay, yeah, so delta y is fixed by the detector. So delta x is basically proportional to one over b. So what this is saying is that if I want to still have a sharp image, I want delta x to be as large as possible no matter where I move my detector, then I want to decrease the aperture size. As I decrease or stop down the aperture, as we call it, Right, or stop down the camera, then we are going to get increased depth of field. Okay, and this may this is a familiar, uh, probably something familiar to you if you have done any photography with, uh, you know, if you're if you're interested in that kind of thing. But we, there's a trade-off, okay? we never get a free lunch. Okay, so you can increase your depth of field, but the cost that you're going to pay is image brightness. Okay. That's the trade-off that we always have to bear in mind. Um, so, okay, so how do we define the image brightness? 
Well, uh, first, let's think about brightness in general. Like, I mean, you know, so if I take some object, okay, and here's your lens, and now this lens has some stop in front of it, or let's just say that the diameter of the lens is D. Okay? And of course, as I just showed you, the D can be adjusted by putting an aperture right in front of it. Okay. Then the number of rays, let's say here's your object point and here's an image point. The number of rays that are intercepted by the lens and that then get focused onto the image point, right? Clearly, the more number of rays I can intercept, the brighter my image is going to be, okay? And uh, another, uh, so I can make more sophisticated definitions. I can use radiometry and all that. I'm not going to introduce that, but we can think of the brightness of the image as the fraction of the rays that are intercepted by the lens from the object that get mapped onto the image divided by the area of the image, okay? It's like saying that the image area is, uh, you know, going to also matter because we want all the, every point here, for example, we want all of those points also to get intercepted and then imaged onto a point. So the object and image area or magnification is also going to play a role in this image brightness. So again, then the definition of image brightness here is, Proportional to the fraction of rays intercepted or reaching the image from the object divided by the image angle. Okay, and um, I'm sure uh, if you think about it, like uh, you can think about it like in this triangle, of course, I re revolve around the axis, that's a cone, right? So there's a cone of rays coming from my object that get intercepted by the, by the lens. And we can write down the solid angle then that, uh, that omega naught is a solid angle of the rays that are intercepted by the lens. And that is in fact going to be given by it's the definition is that it is going to be d squared, right, divided by the distance squared. Okay, I am not going to go through this uh, derivation in detail because, again, it's not super important for what we want to do, but we just need to know that it's proportional to d squared. Okay, and then divided by the distance from the object to the lens, okay, which is, of course, s naught squared. Okay. And, um, and the image area, right, the image area, and if you like, I can post a short video that makes all this a bit more rigorous. But again, as I said, I just want to give you the intuition here. The image area is proportional to the magnification, okay? And of course, to the magnification squared, okay? Which we know from the one of the formulas that we that we saw um, for the for the magnification that that's proportional to the focal length. So image area is proportional to the magnification, which is then proportional to the focal length. So we end up with the image brightness. Again, as I said, I can make all this more rigorous and I, I can post a short video on that as well, if you, if you like. But the point is that this is proportional to D squared over this. So we see just as the image uh, depth of field, the depth of field was proportional to one over D, right? Image brightness is going to be proportional to d squared, okay? Having fixed the focal length, for example. So that's our trade-off. Okay? We are going to sacrifice the brightness if we uh, decrease the increase the depth of field. And that you may be aware uh, in the original first cameras that people invented was called a pinhole camera or camera obscura, right? Where what they did was they made a small hole in a, in something and then they just put your eye behind it. And now because the depth of field is very long. You know, you can you can see many objects, even further away objects, come into focus on your eye. Okay, um, but you had to like be really you know in darkened conditions or something and, and and so on to like really observe those those objects carefully. So that was because you know the brightness was not very good. Okay, and you'll see the same phenomenon when you stop down a camera lens. If you, you decrease the 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 camera. Uh, you're, you're taking a picture of something that's very far away, 
uh, and you want to like increase the depth of field to capture as much of the scene as possible, both near and far objects. So you increase the depth of field to capture both of them. Then you have to stop down your camera lens. And when you do that, you decrease the image brightness and therefore you often have to increase the exposure time, for example. All right, so that's just a quick run through of how these two factors are playing off against each other. And just so you know, if you take up camera photography as a hobby, then you'll have some basic knowledge. There's a lot more to be said there, of course, as you can imagine. Okay, any questions on this depth of field and, and, and you know, all this? Here's my full derivation. But yeah, I'm not okay. Questions? Go back to the slides. I want to talk about lens combinations. That's a really important topic. Okay, so um, like I mentioned, in addition to uh, tracing of like real objects, something that comes up often when we do lens combinations is ray tracing from virtual objects. But as I've told you before, a lot of situations occur where before you can create a real image, you had to put a new lens in, like you already seen that, for example, with like various types of telescopes and microscopes. So in those cases, we have to be able to create a ray tracing or, or figure out where the rays are going to come into focus from a virtual object. So let's go through a virtual object ray tracing example. So first we have the simple case of a virtual object, which is we take a diverging lens, the negative lens, and we trace all the rays that would normally come to focus at the focal point, right? So those are all the rays that would come to, uh, uh, come to focus at the object focal point. That's a virtual object, right? Because now the rays would appear to be coming in from there uh, or diverging from that object. But, uh, sorry, they appear to be converging to that object. So it's a virtual object and not a real object. Okay. If it's a real object, the rays appear to be diverging from it. So in this case, we know that the rays will then emerge parallel from the negative lens. Okay. But now, if I now tilt all the rays a little bit, Okay, if I tilt the rays down, uh, by the way, the central ray, again, the ray one, remember, the chief ray is going straight through. In this case, it was just straight through on the axis. Here, it's not straight through on the axis, it's coming in at an angle, but the same argument holds. Because it's coming into, uh, going to focus at the focal plane now, the, it's at the point, the F naught is a focal point on the axis, it's just that this ray one now is just off the axis, but it's still in the focal plane, okay? And therefore, all the rays that are coming to a focus at that point, that would have come to a focus at that point, they all will emerge parallel to the axis, along with the ray one, which of course goes undeviated. So this is an important principle to keep in mind, because I, we will see now how to use that for uh, ray tracing. Okay, so that just summarizes what I just said. Okay, so now let's do a virtual object. In this case, this is the virtual object over here, the, uh, ladybug, okay? And you can see why it's a virtual object because the ray one, for example, that would have come to a focus over here is now intercepted by this lens, okay? So if this lens weren't here, all of these rays would come to a focus. This would be an image of some other object which is being formed. But now because the, the lens is here in between, now the rays don't get a chance to focus there. So it looks like this is now a virtual object for this lens. Is that clear to everyone? Why this is a virtual object for this lens? No? I don't see. Uh, so, uh, so because, so, uh, so for, for virtual lens, so I think, uh, so for virtual, uh, for, for virtual one, so it's based on that, that whether we, we flip, uh, we, we flip the, the direction of the object. No, that's magnified or magnified. Virtual is, if a, a real object is one from which all the rays appear to diverge, yeah. okay? And a real image is one where all the rays appear to converge. Okay. Without this lens, you can see all the rays would have converged 
to this point here. That's the dashed lines over here are all converging to that point. Okay. So that would have been a real something. Okay, because all the rays are converging. It's a real image, okay, of some other object that we don't see. It's off the screen here, for example. That's the real object from which these rays are coming and would have come to a focus here at this point. Okay. But they don't come to a focus because there's a lens in it. Okay. So this object here is now a virtual object for this lens. Okay. Because all the rays appear to be converging towards that point. It's a virtual object, not a real object. Okay, so how do we trace the rays? Exactly the same way as we did for the real object. So the ray one that would have gone straight through the, the lens still goes straight through the lens. Okay, and now we trace this one ray, ray three, that goes through the, the object focal plane, right? And goes and would have met here at this, uh, at this point over here. Uh, instead, now it's going to emerge parallel to the axis because it goes through the object focal plane, object focal point. Similarly, the ray one, ray two, which is going parallel to the axis and would have meant at this point over here, that's the real, the virtual object point. It now is 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 sent bent through the image focal point. So the place where these three rays meet, that's where the uh, image is formed of this, and that's a real. Yeah, because all the rays are now meeting at this point over here. That's a real image of the virtual object. Okay. Now we can see SO is less than zero in this situation, the sign convention, because the object, the virtual object, is to the right of the lens. So SO is less than zero, but SI is greater than zero. Again, magnification should become obvious from here. SI is smaller than SO. So the magnification is less than one, and that's exactly what the ray tracing also shows us. So the, the image is smaller than the object. Here. Okay, that was for a object which was located to the right of a positive lens. What about a negative lens? Okay, so same virtual object here, okay? The ray one still goes through undeviated, so that's fine. Ray three now, notice that the ray three has sort of switched places, so to speak here, okay? That's because it has to be directed towards the object focal point of the lens on this side, which is to the right, okay? It's still directed towards the, um, uh, the, the, the virtual object point that's over here at the top. Similarly, ray two is still parallel to the axis and directed to the virtual object point. But now it will appear to diverge from the image focal point. Okay, because this is a negative lens. Similarly, this guy will appear to come, will, will go parallel to the axis because it's directed towards the object focal point. And therefore it emerges parallel to the axis. And again, tracing these rays back, I get this image, and now this is a virtual image. Because the there are no rays actually meeting here, the rays all appear to diverge from that point. So that's a virtual image point. Again, the sign convention tells us S0 is still lesser than zero because this object is to the right and it's a virtual object. And this one here, it's a virtual image with SI lesser than zero. Okay, and now we do the final case, so to speak, which is we're going to take a virtual object, which is now uh, uh, greater than, uh, I'm sorry, this is a virtual object which is in between the focal point. Again, it's a negative lens. Okay, we can work through this case. So again, it's located to the right of the lens, but before the focal point. This one was after the focal point or past the focal point. Okay, and now the ray tracing looks a little bit more different. That's because now the ray that is going towards the object focal plane has to come from here. Okay. I mean, I guess I could make one more ray that goes here as well. That would just emerge parallel to the axis down here. But that obviously would not come from this point over here. So um, it wouldn't come from the top of the label. Okay. This is the this is a virtual object that would have been formed if these three rays were allowed to travel without the lens. They would meet here. That's our virtual object point. So from this virtual object point again, the ray two is is deviated away such that it is emerging from the from the image focal plane, the image focal point, and this one this ray is appearing to go towards the object focal point. Comes out undeviated, uh, comes out parallel to the axis. And ray one is undeviated. So the image is now formed 
you know, in between the, sorry, the image is now formed over here, okay? And this time it's a real image, right? Because all the rays converge towards that. So it is possible to get that real image from a virtual object and a negative lens. Okay, so that was summarizing virtual object ray tracing. And now I want to introduce one more type of ray tracing, which is called focal plane ray tracing. This will again be helpful when we do thin lens combinations. So again, the reason for this is when we do thin lens combinations, we'll sometimes have rays that don't form that ray one, two, three type rays. Okay, they'll, they'll be different. And so this is a technique that we can use to trace out those rays as well. The basic idea is shown here. Let's imagine a ray, some ray from some object, which is coming and hitting the lens at the point B. We see that that same ray also intersects the object focal plane at the point A. What we do is we draw a line from A to O, okay? And we say that the amount of bending for this ray, so if I didn't have this ray A to O, I wouldn't know how much this ray would bend after it hits the point B, okay? We know it won't go hit the focal plane because this ray is not parallel to the axis, right? It's coming in at an angle. It's not parallel to the axis. And unless it went through the object focal plane, we know it won't emerge parallel to the axis either. So this is an intermediate ray, okay? So the way to trace this ray is to draw an imaginary line from A to O, and then draw a line from B towards the object focal point uh, at the same angle. So you can see this ray, this, this is not a real ray, by the way. Sorry that this drawing makes it look like it's there's a ray coming out here. It's not. This is like an imaginary line that I draw, and I'll show you an example of this. There's an imaginary line I draw, and then I basically shift it up to where it meets the point B. That is the actual direction of the ray that comes out from the point B. And you can see it now intersects the axis at the point C. So that's where the 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 B, the, the ray B will meet the axis is at the point C over there. Here we do this for a negative lens as well. Same idea. Now the idea here is that if I take the ray, which is coming here, uh, before the negative uh, lens was put in, it would have hit the focal plane of this lens right here at this point. So this is again a virtual object, right? So ray A is the virtual object. Okay, or, or the point A is a virtual object for the for the negative lens. And if I extend that ray backward, right, or if I create a, a, a line between A to the center O, okay. Uh, by the way, even though there is no uh, ray over here, you can see that any ray that went from the, if there was some other ray going from the point O and, and A and O, it would go through undeviated. So that's why it's still drawn there. The same idea here, there must, there might be some ray that comes through undeviated through the through the lens and meets at the point A as well, okay? So anyway, so the point is, I've drawn that dashed line once again, and now to know how much the, the ray deviates at the point B, which is where this meets the lens, I simply take this ray and move it parallel, okay? And that's how this ray must come out, okay? That's the focal plane ray trace. Okay, in the last, few minutes, I want to talk about thin lens combinations ray tracing. Okay, so the basic idea of thin lens ray tracing uh, in this situation, and this is a very simple situation, I think, uh, that you all will understand fairly easily, which is both F1 and F2 are greater than zero, so two positive lenses, and D, the distance between the lenses is greater than the sum of the focal lengths. Okay, so F1 plus F2 is greater, uh, sorry, the distance is greater than F1 plus F2. Which means, as you can see, the focal distance of the first lens and the focal distance of the second lens, there's still some space in between those two. They don't coincide with each other and they don't overlap the other. Okay. So this distance D is greater than the sum of F1 plus F2. Okay, so let, let's start with an object whose object distance is S01 over here. Okay. And we can trace the rays. Okay. So we'll trace the rays two and three. Remember two is the one that's parallel to the axis. Three is the one that goes to the object focal plane, okay? So two will be deviated straight into the image focal plane of the first lens. Three will emerge parallel. And you see that an intermediate image would be formed over here, okay? A real intermediate image would be formed because those rays meet over there. What about the ray four? I'll introduce that in a second, okay? So now how do I trace the rays from here, well, if I use focal plane ray tracing, you'll see that we can actually figure out 
what will happen to ray two? Okay, we'll 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 see where ray two intersects the focal plane. We'll draw a ray a, a dashed line from that point to O two, and then we'll know that wherever this ray intersects the lens, we must make the ray bend by that amount. Okay, but I'm not doing that here for a second. Instead, I'm just going to focus on a third ray. Okay, because I need so so the parallel ray, which is the one that was ray three. Of course, we can extend it parallel outward, and then that will go through the focal point F2, Fi2. So that's one ray. We need one more ray. Okay. To make that one more ray, we take this intermediate image, which is a real image. So there are rays going through there, right? Coming out from that image. And that, that ray, which goes straight through the second lens, the center of the second lens, will go over here. It will be undeviated. Of course, we don't know where this ray came from because it was not the ray two or three. So we have to trace it backward like this. We say, okay, where did this ray come from? Well, when it came here, it must have come from the object point. So I draw a line connecting this point and that point. Okay. So that's a ray four for a thin lens combination. That's how I've drawn the 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 the, the ray tracing diagram. So we use rays two and three, which are the normal rays. And then we kind of had to introduce this ray four. And I'll show you in a minute, as I said, it's not necessary. We can use focal plane ray tracing to get rid of this ray four. And we can also understand why ray four bends in the way that it does. Again, imagine that this ray was meeting the, the focal point over here. I would draw a line from here to here. And that's exactly by how much this ray bends. Okay, I know I was just drawing on the, with, with like, you know, my fingers over there. In a minute, I'll show you on the slide. Uh, with another situation, how to visualize these lines okay, for focal plane ray tracing. But that is the general ray tracing for this simple case. This is the simplest sort of case that we can do. Two positive lenses and D greater than F1 plus F2. And in this case, we can also do the math fairly straightforward. Okay, We just find the image from the lens one. We use the lens equation. Okay, And from that, we can solve for the position of that intermediate image. That intermediate image that so the real image, I can just solve for it, okay? And then I use that image as the object for the lens two, okay? And to find that, I need to know what is the distance SO2, this distance SO2, okay? So that's pretty straightforward. I calculated SI1 from the first equation, and I know the distance D. So I just subtract, okay? So SO2 is simply D minus SI1, makes sense? I put that back into the lens equation for the second lens, calculate SI2. So that is now in terms of SI2 is in terms of SI1 and F2 and D. But SI1 is in terms of the original object distance and F1. Put that back in. Algebra, okay, I'm skipping it. Remember, in most in these kinds of derivations where there's some very, very complicated formula, I don't want you to like try and memorize the formula. Just understand the steps. Because in a real example or something, I'll give you either numbers or it'll be something where you don't have to, you know, jump through all of this algebra here, you know. But you should understand the method. The method was to first create an image from lens one and use that image as the object for lens two. Okay, that's the basic principle. Okay, so now I'll do focal plane ray tracing of that same thin lens combination. Oh, by the way, I should also mention the magnification, the same idea, because the mag the first the intermediate image that was formed was magnified by the amount MT1 from the original object. And then that served as the object for the second lens. So that then gets magnified again by the second lens as MT2. So the total magnification must be MT1 times MT2. Okay, it's just a ratio of all the heights. Okay, so now we do focal plane ray tracing. And now I'm showing you those same rays that we had earlier neglected. So we have the ray two, okay. And that ray two meets the focal plane of the second lens at the point A2. Okay. Similarly, ray three meets the focal plane of the second lens uh, at this point A3. In addition, we can draw the ray one, which goes straight through the first lens. Remember, we've always drawn ray one before, but I didn't show it on the previous one. That's because, again, as I see, as you can see, it meets this point over here at the point P1, which is kind of, you don't know what to do with it. Now. It's not one of the standard places. Similarly with ray two, we didn't know what to do with it because it was not meeting at one of the standard locations and or directed towards the standard location. Well, with focal plane ray tracing, we can know exactly how much all of these rays bend. By taking the rays, uh, taking A3, directing it towards O with this dashed line, A1, 
with this dash line A2 with this dash line, and now simply making them all parallelly and translate to these different rays. So A2 to O, I translate that to the point P2 and just make that make a parallel line at that same angle, and that's going to go this way. Similarly, P1, uh, I take the A1 to O ray and translate that downward, and that's this ray over here, B1 going upward, and similarly B3 is the, is the ray A3 to O, taking that and translating it and making it parallel to, uh, to that B3 line. And of course, we know the B3 line, we also know which point it must go through. It must go through the focal point because it's parallel to the axis. So we can see exactly that that matches. And therefore we have all of the three rays that we need to create the image. So this is the way we can use focal plane ray tracing to simplify or make the argument for the ray tracing a little simpler uh, with this situation. Okay, I think I'll stop there for today and we will uh, finish up the last couple of other examples of ray tracing. Uh, either I'll put a little video or we'll do it in the next one.